D. James Kennedy Ministries presents Truths That Transform. They've taken the shackles off of the government and put them onto the people. The very opposite of what the founders meant in the First Amendment. The state of Oregon, late in 2015, went into the bank account of Aaron and Melissa without their permission, cleaned out the entire bank account. This is Truths That Transform. Thanks for joining us for another edition of Truths That Transform. I'm Frank Wright, president of D. James Kennedy Ministries. I'd like to take a moment to remind you that we are a viewer-supported program. You'll also want to make sure you visit our ministry website for a wealth of free resources, including video, audio, digital, and print content. It's all available at djameskennedy.org. The conflict between the religious freedom America was founded upon and the modern-day homosexual and transgender movement seems to be reaching critical mass. A biblical stance on these sexual issues is now branded as being hate, which means the protection of religious viewpoints is quickly evaporating. Could churches be silenced as the acceptance of same-sex relationships and an alphabet soup of genders becomes politically correct orthodoxy? Recently, I had the opportunity to sit down and talk about it in Washington, D.C. with Christiana Holcomb of the Alliance Defending Freedom. My reading of the First Amendment is that there are five parts to it. There's the religion clause, there's the speech clause, there's the freedom of press, freedom of assembly, and the right to petition the government for redress of grievances. One of those five elements seems to be under incredible duress in our day, and that's the free exercise of religion. What, what's happened in America to where churches no longer have the freedoms to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, special interest groups are pushing laws that we call sexual orientation, gender identity ordinances. And what they're trying to do is insert into these non-discrimination laws protections for certain types of conduct. And that is conduct which the majority of all faiths across America today believe to be sinful and inconsistent with their religious beliefs. For example, they're trying to insert protections for sexual orientation, um, who you love, men, women, both sexes or neither sex, gender identity, how you identify and perceive your gender regardless of your actual biological sex. And so what we're seeing is these non-discrimination laws that protect these types of conduct are on a collision course with the First Amendment, with the free exercise of religion of people of faith, of entities of faith, and even churches, and how they exercise their religious convictions. What, uh, what's changed, though? There have always been people who stand opposed to Christian teaching, Christian ideals, Christian doctrines. Um, the argument has always historically been that, well, it's just wrong, the, the Bible, the text is wrong. You know, so there have been, there've been opponents to Christian teaching before, but Christians themselves have always had freedom to speak in response to those opponents. We seem to be losing that freedom today. What has changed is proponents of these ordinances now have the force of law behind them. And they're using it to not only silence all dissent, but really to crush those who oppose what they stand for. And that includes the church. The Supreme Court created out of whole cloth a new right, and that's the right of same-sex marriage. That's working its way through at state and local level. and. Um, Many people, businesses, um, Christian couples, individuals are facing incredible mm -hmm. uh, threats against their livelihood. Yes. Creative business professionals are in a really tough place right now with the current status of the law. However, Alliance Defending Freedom has created a resource for creative professionals. And I encourage you to visit adflegal.org to download that resource. It's not a foolproof method, but there are no guarantees with the current status of the law. 
it's courts can still rule as they as they will. That's exactly right. We can't guarantee, first of all, to avoid litigation, first of all, and secondly, we can't guarantee that you will ultimately win. But what we can say is given the current state of the law and our expertise in this area, we believe that following these steps will place you in a better legal position. Wise as serpents, gentle as doves, yes. right? Be taking common sense protections mm -hmm. in, given the environment that we live in. What do you say in response to those who see a divide in the life of Christians that uh, we're to render under Caesar, yes, but we're also to submit to the authority of the governing bodies God has placed over us because they were established by God, Romans 13. What do you say to someone who sees himself constrained by the scriptures in that manner? I say that we are the governing body in Romans 13. As a democratic republic, as a self-governing society, we hold the reins of power. We are ultimately responsible. And to fail to exercise our civic duty to vote and to hold our elected leaders accountable is a failure on our part to fulfill our duty under Romans 13. What is one thing about the future implications of the Supreme Court's decision on same-sex marriage that if people better understood it, they would better understand the threat embodied in it? The Supreme Court's same-sex marriage decision did not once mention protecting the free exercise of religion. The majority opinion assures us that we may continue to advocate for and teach that marriage is between one man and one woman. But ominously, the court never used the term exercise. And we know that the First Amendment protects our right to exercise our faith, not just to believe. So that, I think, is very concerning. The First Amendment clearly provides for the free exercise of religion, as Christiana Holcomb explained. Nevertheless, an honest reading of that amendment is hard to come by in today's courts. Indeed, the First Amendment has been turned upside down. Meant to protect citizens from their government, it is now frequently used to protect government from citizens of faith. My friend and mentor, Dr. D. James Kennedy, saw what was coming with courts abusing the First Amendment and erecting a so-called wall of separation between church and state. Their true goal, of course, is to separate God and state. As Dr. Kennedy explains in this portion of his message, Dawn's Early Light. The Dawn's Early Light is my title for today's message on religious liberty, the separation of church and state. As I pick this phrase from Francis Scott Key's Star Spangled Atom and use it to consider the light that the early foundations of this nation shine upon a question and issue of great importance today, the matter of religious freedom. Though the secularists are doing their very best to get rid of every vestige of Christianity and religion in this country, there's no doubt that that's not the way it was in the beginning. We have lost sight of the light that the Founding Fathers tried to shine in that dawn's early light upon the future of this country. We've taken the train and taken it off the tracks that were laid down so carefully by our Founders, and we have tried to reject religion and replace it with secularism. You wonder, how could this have happened? Where did the train get derailed? If we want to find something, we have to go back to the exact place where we lost it. And that place, my friends, is found in the year 1947 and in the halls of the Supreme Court in a decision that you should all remember and inscribe on the walls of your prayer life, the Everson decision. And in that decision, the very liberal Justice Hugo Black quotes the phrase, there should be a wall of separation between church and state, and indicates that this is supposed to be a secular nation. And by the way, that decision passed by one vote, five to four. One man throughout 150 years of American history and Christian religious principles and faith and ushered in this ungodly immorality that we've seen in our day. A separation 
of church and state? Do you remember what John Quincy Adams says? He said, the highest glory of the American Revolution was that it united in one indissoluble bond the principles of Christianity and the principles of civil government. But in one stroke, the Everson decision erected a wall severing that indissoluble bond. Now, is that not just shorthand for the First Amendment? No, 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 it is not. It is a complete distortion of it. And if you are not familiar with how it distorts it, let me remind you. The First Amendment, like the entire First Ten Amendments, the Bill of Rights, were all one-way streets. They were written for one single purpose, to protect you, the people of the United States, from the newly created Leviathan, the federal government. And men like George Washington and Patrick Henry would not even sign the Constitution until they were assured there would be a Bill of Rights protecting the rights of the people. George Washington later said in a letter that if he had thought that in any way this government would become hostile to any religious organization, that he would have never affixed his name to it. Question, in the last decade, whenever you've heard anything about the separation of church and state, what is it talking about? Is it talking about what the government can do? No. It's talk is it even talking about what churches can do? Hardly ever. It's almost always talking about what Christians or other religious people can or cannot do. Completely turned around. They've taken the shackles off of the government and put them onto the people. The very opposite of what the founders meant in the First Amendment. The founding fathers of this country meant that this was not a secular nation. It was not to be hostile to religion but it was to accommodate it and encourage it, as Justice Joseph Story says in his first commentary on the Constitution of the United States, to encourage Christianity. The intention of the Constitution and the First Amendment was to encourage Christianity to the extent that it was compatible with freedom of conscience, conscience and worship. I believe we will see something wonderful happen in this country. We will put the train back on the tracks that were laid out for it by, this, by the founding fathers of this country. We will restore religious liberty to this nation. I believe that we will see also the throwing out of the so-called wall of separation doctrine, which has contributed so enormously to the increasing secularization, ungodliness, immorality, and crime in our country. Dear friends, pray that that may happen. The Berlin Wall has fallen. The Iron Curtain has fallen. And this suppositious wall of separation is going to fall. As Dr. Kennedy pointed out, when it comes to religion, the courts have taken the shackles off the government where they belong and have put them on the people where they don't belong. The First Amendment is there to protect citizens from government interference with the exercise of their religion. And yet everywhere we look, we see government attacking Christians simply for living out their faith. One egregious example we've shared with you is the case of Melissa and Aaron Klein, owners of the Oregon bakery Sweet Cakes by Melissa. Our own Jerry Newcomb brings us this update of their story. Question, is there a magnet at the threshold of your business which takes away all your constitutional rights once you cross over that threshold? Well, tragically, many Christians in the wedding industry of late have been told that they must participate in celebrating same-sex weddings, regardless of conscience, or they'll be forced out of business, or worse. I specialize in um, wedding cakes and custom-designed uh, cakes. We owned a bakery. Um, actually, it was more of a custom-designed cake shop. Um, 
Everything was a made to order, I mean, specifically designed as the customer wanted. We really like to make it very specific to each individual couple. We did quite a few weddings, I'd probably say about 150, 160 weddings a year. Uh, we, it was Gresham, Oregon based. Uh, we delivered every, everywhere from Ashland all the way up uh, past Seattle. We wanted in everything that we did in our business, we wanted to use, I wanted to use my you know, artistic ability to glorify, glorify the Lord. But in early 2013, their sweet success turned sour when their conscience did not allow them to create a wedding cake to celebrate the union of two lesbians. January 2013, we had a girl and her mom come in requesting us to do her wedding cake, return customer. Um, when I learned what the cake was for, um, I couldn't in good conscience take part in it. It was something that flew right in the face with the Bible defined as marriage. Uh, Aaron politely declined that that was not something they were able to support with their beliefs. And uh, soon thereafter, they found themselves this, the target of a long administrative proceeding in, uh, in, in Oregon, uh, and ultimately were, were penalized $135,000 plus uh, for, for simply declining some business because their faith would not allow them to continue to do that. Because of uh, the boycotting, the demonstrations that happened, everything that's gone on, we've lost our storefront. We've lost what was our main source of income for our family. We've been accused of, or called a hater, a bigot, every name that you can possibly think of in the book. Um, you know, at first, you know, I won't lie, it, like, it really hurt and it really hit me hard because it was like, how am I a hater? You know, like, just because I don't want to do something, don't I, you know, do I not have um, rights to say what I want to do and what I don't want to do. I shouldn't have to be forced to do something that violates my religious beliefs. The state of Oregon demanded that the clients pay a hefty fine to the lesbian couple for not baking their wedding cake. And on top of that, they even issued a gag order on the clients from being able to talk about the case. In 2015, the uh, Bureau of Labor and Industries ruled against us. Um, they said that we had discriminated um, against the two girls and they charged us with $135,000 in emotional damages. The $135,000 that was awarded to these girls uh, was split two different ways. We had $75,000 for the girl that was present at the shop. 60000 for the girl that uh, hadn't set f foot in my shop for over a year and a half. Um, the $15,000 was simply for being there and having to hear those words, I'm really sorry, I didn't mean to waste your time. Um, that, that was worth $15,000 according to this judge. The $135,000 fine is to go to the lesbian couple to compensate for the supposed emotional damages sweet cakes caused them. Here is a list of the nearly 80 alleged symptoms the couple claims they experienced because sweet cakes would not bake their wedding cake. You add the damages on top of that that the state could impose, and yeah, I could file, I, I could lose my house, I could file bankruptcy, I, you know, it, it, it could, and we're not talking about two people that owned a multi-million dollar business, we're talking about a husband and wife that owned a small shop that supported their five kids. Aaron and Melissa Klein are now represented in this case by First Liberty Institute. We spoke recently with Jeremy Dice, attorney for First Liberty. Jeremy, give us an update on the Sweet Cakes by Melissa story. Yeah, the penalty itself went for $135,000. And what happened is the state of Oregon, late in 2015, went into the bank account of Aaron and Melissa without their permission, cleaned out the entire bank account. And that wasn't enough to satisfy the penalty. And so thankfully there had been some crowdsourcing that had gone on. Uh, moms and pops across the country given a dollar or two here and there. And they were able to take that money, put it into an escrow account to satisfy that penalty. And it's just gonna hold right there until First Liberty does its job. The case was on appeal. So how in the world could the state justify going in and just taking their money from the bank account? It'll be interesting to see how the state defends actually going into their bank account swapping out all their money. They had nothing left in that bank account once they got in there, and it still wasn't enough to satisfy the penalty. But the bottom line is this. No citizen in this country ought to fear 
the government going into your bank account and clearing it out to satisfy some penalty for simply exercising your faith as a part of your business. The other side might say, well, look, bottom line is there was a time when uh, people didn't want to allow for a black person to marry a white person. And the Supreme Court said that's wrong, that's bigotry, and they said that's unconstitutional. Aaron and Melissa served this couple previously. They provided them cakes for other ceremonies. It just came to an issue where their conscience would, wouldn't allow them to go farther. This case has such broad, far-reaching uh, concerns is because it, every American worker, every small business owner, every family business, every major corporation, their religious liberty rights are at stake with Aaron and Melissa Klein, and it all came down to a cake. You know, the hardest thing has been watching my wife go through this. She loved doing cakes. She loved being a part of people's day. And to have that stripped away to the level it has been has just, I mean, it has been devastating. The hardest thing for me, I think, would be that, uh, that I lost my shop. I lost something that I really love doing. I would definitely say it's been the hardest thing. Sadly, the story of Aaron and Melissa Klein is being repeated around the nation as Christians who stand for their convictions against a modern sexual agenda are punished. And if we think it can't happen to our churches, we are being naive. If it's so offensive to decline to bake a wedding cake for a same-sex wedding, how much more offensive will it be when churches refuse to perform such weddings because of their convictions? What about when those churches preach against it? Attempting to muzzle churches, of course, is nothing new, but you have a chance to stand against it. Here's my good friend Jennifer Kennedy Cassidy with more. Jennifer, welcome. Thank you, Frank. We live in an era when mere dissent is characterized as hate speech. As a result, those who would declare God's truth from the Bible on such issues as same-sex marriage and transgenderism must be silenced. For decades, the left has tried to use the Internal Revenue Service as a hammer against Christian churches. Former Chief Justice John Marshall once noted that the power to tax is the power to destroy and the Founding Fathers intended churches to be exempt from taxation because churches don't exist under the state but alongside it. The state is to have no power to destroy churches. But now, churches that speak out on political issues are threatened with having their tax exemptions revoked. Americans United for the Separation of Church and State regularly send letters to churches ominously warning them to avoid certain topics or be reported to the IRS. That sounds more like a dictatorship than America. And it's time we stood up to such bullying. We have to put together an urgent petition we want you to sign calling upon your leaders in Washington, D.C. to support the Houses of Worship Free Speech Restoration Act. The bill that's been proposed would protect churches from harassment and silencing by the IRS. Please, get your petitions to your senators and representatives, sign them, and return them right away. Freedom lost is very difficult to ever regain, so time is of the essence. Simply write to us at Box 6084, Albert Lee, Minnesota, 56007, or call toll-free 877-962-7677 or go online at djameskennedy.org. And if you are able to give a generous donation to the ongoing work of this ministry, when you contact us, we will also send you a copy of the hard-hitting book, The IRS Exposed. Not only has the IRS been used as a weapon to silence churches, but recent evidence has shown that they've also targeted conservative Christian groups for audit. It's an outrageous abuse of power, and it's crucial that you know what's going on so they can't take your freedom away. We'll send you the petitions calling for protection for churches against the IRS, as well as the powerful book, The IRS Exposed, as our thanks for your generous donation. Simply write to us at Box 6084, Albert Lee, Minnesota, 56007, or call toll-free 
877-962-7677 or go online at djameskennedy.org. Rock star Bruce Springsteen recently canceled a concert in Greensboro, North Carolina. His stated reason was that North Carolina had passed a so-called bathroom bill maintaining the separation of men's and women's restrooms based on biological gender. This, according to Springsteen, was a cruel violation of the rights of transgendered people. And so he boycotted the Tar Heel State in protest. Springsteen was immediately hailed by liberals around the nation for his supposedly courageous stance. But it's interesting to notice the stunning hypocrisy of the left on this issue. Bruce Springsteen protested what he saw as discrimination in North Carolina by discriminating against North Carolinians. Of course, nobody questions his right to do that. But let's think about that for a second. Bruce Springsteen's personal conscience made him decide that he didn't want to provide his services for a North Carolina audience. And he gets widely applauded for that. But if Christian bakers or wedding photographers decide that their consciences won't allow them to provide services for same-sex ceremonies, they are vilified as hate filled bigots and prosecuted by governments. Of course, entertainers are not exactly known for their consistent political philosophies, but if consistency and logic were part of this equation, Bruce Springsteen would now be facing charges from a hate crimes tribunal and forced to either play the concert or be fined into bankruptcy. Of course, that would be a travesty of justice. This is America, and Springsteen should be able to play or not play for whomever he wants. Now, will he and his ideological fellow travelers on the left grant Christians the same right? Well, call me skeptical, but I doubt it. Under the new speak of political correctness, rights are only for those people whose viewpoints are acceptable. Acceptable to whom? Acceptable to a hardcore cadre of left-wing progressive socialists who are determined to drive religious expression from the public square. I'm Frank Wright. Thank you for joining us on Truths That Transform. We'll see you next time. Next week on Truths That Transform. Well, if we're going to reclaim America, how are we going to do it? Well, I think the scriptures are very explicit. Glad and Right Wing Watch found out that the Benham brothers were going to be on HGTV, and they were not going to have that. That's next week. Today's program is available on DVD for your gift to this ministry of any amount. Please call, write, or log on to our website today. This has been a production of D. James Kennedy Ministries.